pleasure to introduce the next two speakers, uh, John Swinger and Kimi Bell. Um, John received his bachelor degree at the University of Edinburgh and his PhD at the University of Cambridge. And he first came to Scripps in 1964 for two months. And I can only guess that he fell in love with these places because he decided to come back and develop the heat flow program here. Uh, John is well known for his work on the evolution of ocean basins. He demonstrated that the age of the seafloor controls its depth. And he also made important contributions to the understanding of the hydrothermal circulation and the evolution of the Indian Ocean and the Central Eastern Pacific, where magnetic anomalies could not be recognized so easily. Currently, John continues the SIO heat of flow program in collaboration with Raquel Negrete, Cicete, and Senada, uh, with some exciting results in the Wagner Basin in New Mexico. And I also want to mention that John is uh, also the one that has helped us to put together this symposium. And on the other hand, Lee Bell has spent most of his career in the exploration geophysics industry. He has successfully combined the theoretical and practical aspects of exploration to physics with a business vision to make a significant impact on the industry. For example, after earning his master and PhD degrees in geophysics from Stanford, um, Lee pioneered and led the initial commercial use of seismic data processing technologies from the early 1980s. Since then, he has held various top positions of companies in exploration geophysics and he currently serves as the chief to physicist at uh, geokinetics processing. And finally, while at Scripps, uh, Lee and John and colleagues show that the creation of new plate at a spreading center could account for the heat flow and subsidence of the ocean floor. They established that the plate model that explained the ridges, trenches, and earthquakes could also account for the subsidence of the ocean floor as the age of the ocean crust increases. Please welcome John and Lee Bell. Look at the unexpurgated version. 
It actually is a lot more exciting. <laughs> well, obviously somebody else who looked at this thing did the same thing as me because they said, no, this is pretty important. So to remove or alter those part of a text was considered offensive, vulgar, or otherwise unseemly. Okay. But they were so successful in doing that, it actually had a secondary view, which is to edit the text such that it removed all flavor. Okay? And candidly, this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to really talk very much about science, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk mostly about history. And of course, my problem in life was at 15, I wanted to be a historian. Uh, but my father wouldn't pay me to do that, so I ended up as a scientist. Okay, the history. So what I want to do, first of all, is to go back to the early history. And in terms of doing this, I'm going to go through it. And I'm going to go back to 1912. Is it starts with speculation. Um, I call these errors, but I'm, I'm not sure that's quite the right word. Insights, mistakes, and then finally success. Okay? And the second part I'm going to do is talk about a paper that I wrote with, with, uh, with Lee Mel and uh, Roger Anderson, which has the same problem of being popularized um, as this one, but it comes from a somewhat different perspective, but I'm directly involved. Okay, where do we come from and where does this problem start? And I don't know if you know, but it starts with a graduate student at uh, MIT called Steve Hallinger, and he once read he when he came over from statistics to do geology, and Peter and I know him really well. Peter, was he a student of yours? Was he you, his advisor? Yeah. Okay. He actually had the audacity to try and teach himself some geology, so he read Wegener. Okay? Mm -hmm. And after reading to the end of Wegener, which I don't think many people do, he came into my lab and said, you know, all of your time, all of the stuff that you've done that day is absolutely <coughs> in Wegener. Well, I completely forgot about this for 35 years ago until I had to give a talk on the AGU, and I decided to read Wegener, and I did. And then it, and I said, oh, there's something wrong here. And then I went back and decided to read John Murray. Okay, Murray is a very, very famous British oceanographer. In fact, the whole field of oceanographer is called, oceanography is, is called after John Murray. He was a Canadian Scot. He did, first of all, good medicine, and then he did geology, um, and he was also an explorer and a person of tremendous energy. I think he edited all 35 volumes of the Challenger expedition. He measured the depths of all the lochs and lakes in Britain, and he's actually famous for producing this. First of all, famous for producing oh, sorry, let's go back one, for producing this map, which is a map of the of, of the oceans. You look at this map here, and you couldn't tell. This is based on 5,000 observations that he compiled. It was done in probably about 1908 and published in, 19, in 1912. And it shows a ridge axis going down here, down the center, exactly overlaps, clearly mimics the continental coastlines on either side. He also showed that the depth between here and about this point up there is about 2,000 above. I can't remember, 1,200 fathoms or 1,300 fathoms, which is about 2,500 meters. Okay. <coughs> the other thing that he did, and the problem with his book is it's about yay thick. So it, it's, it's thicker than a Bible. The definition of being a Bible is you can stand, you can take the book, and you can actually stand up on its own. So any geophysics book that you've ever seen is called the Bible by us. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and it can stand on its own. Okay? But I mean he did an amazing thing. First of all he showed I'm going to try to convert the fathoms into meters. 3,000 meter high ridge down the center of the Pacific. It mirrored the coastlines on either edge. Now that's not that's pretty state of form. But I, I what I don't understand is that all, almost everybody when I well first of all I never I went to Edinburgh University as a, as a geologist student. I never heard okay, of John Murray. It wasn't, in fact, until I got to Cambridge, okay, and I was a student with Morris Hill, that Morris pointed out who John Murray was to me, and also <laughs> to me he'd done something pretty sensible, and how could I, coming from Edinburgh with a partial geology degree, um, actually know nothing about him, okay? 
He argued from the dissolution of the carbonates and the clays. And I mean, he had to have had this from his medical background, knowing dissolutions and stuff like that. In the oceans, if you look at right now, when you have the deposit of carbon in sediments, carbonaceous material, when it gets down to a depth of about 3,000, 3,500, maybe 4,000 meters, it dissolves. Okay? So you have no problem. <laughs> He was effective enough that when he took the, the course on the Challenger expedition, he looked at them carefully, okay? He plotted out where the red clays were deposited. He also plotted out where the carbonates were deposited. The first thing that he said, actually the thing is he said, okay, we have some cores that have gone in here, okay? They have red clay over carbon, okay? The ridges are at 2,000 meters step depth right now, okay? So now, that means, in fact, that in order to get them to dissolve it and put the red clays on top, it has to have subsided by 2,000 meters, okay, at least. The other thing which I still can't find out, but I thought I'd seen it in the book, I mean, it's a hard book to read, um, is that if you look at the Pacific, he plotted, I mean, God, the guy was incredible. He plotted all the cores that they'd taken on the Challenger expedition and other people had done. They plotted out the red clays as it gets carbonates, and the red clays in the Pacific are about 4,000 um, kilometers from the ridge axis. Okay, if you just use the same argument as used before, this means that the ridge is no, not only subsided, okay, 2,000 meters, it's more moved 4,000 kilometers. Okay? That's what happens if you read the thing carefully. Now, as far as I know, nobody read that thing carefully, including some carefully, including Bill Menard, who was the only person I knew that, that actually knew much about the work of, uh, of uh, you know, Murray. And of course, the other thing he's, he's really famous for is, is that he's considered the founder of oceanography. And given the, the amount that he did and the fact that he funded some one major oceanographic expedition himself, he, he well deserves that title. The next thing, I'm going to go back and see. Okay, the next thing that came to me and actually got me started off with this was the thing that Steve Ellinger pointed out to me. And this is taking out of page 141 in uh, <coughs> And what he does is, if I'm going to, in my opinion, the differences of depth are also to be explained by the temperature relationships. And then he did some calculations, which are up here at the left. He showed that a 30 kilometer intrusion, okay, at a, at a temperature of 1,000 degrees, gives a 300 meter elevation. So if you put a, three, a block, you intrude it in, okay, it's 30 kilometers, sticks it, it's 1,000 degrees, it's eventually going to go down after some time, but the elevation difference is going to be 300 meters. If you now take a block that goes in that's 120 kilometers, it gives 1,200 meters of elevation. 1,400 degrees, it gives up to 1,700. Then if you do the thing that a lot of us forgot, Early on, you had the effect of the water. You're up to now 2,250 no, 20, meters. The difference between the Mid Atlantic Ridge and the abyssal plains on either side is probably around 2,500 meters. In other words, if you just took, if Wagner had simply taken this stuff, gone back and read, read um, Murray, I mean, Wagner was a really bright guy. Now, my belief is I'm sort of an original thinker. I'm sure that he could have actually he could have actually developed a lot of the things. Maybe he even see for spreading. But the problem, of course, was that Murray's work was was from Britain. Um, the work that was done by Wagner and the first people that he was doing to were, were also the quotes are actually Germans. They had actually very poor bathymetric maps at that time. And by the time I presume the war was over, things had kind of stabilized out. He, was, he had gone on from the writing book that got published in 1924, which is in fact, I think, no, I don't know anybody who's read the previous thing, I, the previous version of this is just a reprint, basically, of his 1915 book, which was written in German. Okay, so you can, you can, you can actually uh, give Wagner a pass for not doing this, but who you can't give the pass is my, my favorite geologist, or physicist, chemist. That's Arthur Holmes. Okay. I mean, Holmes, as we saw in here, I mean, Holmes had done tremendous things. He had this this idea, of, of course, of convective systems. He had kind of a kind of a plate that's moving down another side of the rigid. 
But the question was, he comes in here with his swell at the beginning, and he has all the stuff coming up on the side, and on the other side. I, I can't believe that if he had actually read Murray carefully, okay, that he could not have actually intruded something in here at a diagram that was subsiding, and that all of the material that was, get, was here was going to actually be produced on either side. And it kind of, I kind of, kind of have to think back on this, and I think that in both cases, the situation with both of them was that they had already speculated on one thing and gone far enough and got so much static back that they really weren't in a place, okay, to actually move forward and to continue their speculations. And that was something that they, that they, had, a pro that, that they uh, had a problem with. Well, things didn't move in terms of convection until about 1965. I mean, I, the, the problems with what um, Harry Hess did have already been talked about here, so I'm not going to look at them. But they, in terms of getting the, the explanation of depth and age, um, Hess had, had real problems. The first one that I thought that was really interesting is that in 1965, which is the, the, this paper published by um, <coughs> Le Bichon, Langseth, Le Bichon, and Ewing, where in fact Zabe introduces the idea of a plate with an intrusion that comes up right at the center and, and moves it apart. What, of course, when I looked at it first, I didn't even look at this diagram, I just looked at his conclusions. And of course his conclusion was that plate tectonics doesn't exist, it's not right, and that in fact he, he, well, he just wants plate tectonics, he was arguing against secret spreading. The difficulty, and I mean, I, I thought, and I mean Jean Franchot and I, who, who was working with me, we thought this was an incredible thing. Actually, the person who pointed this diagram out to me was Dan. Okay, and then I sort of read read the thing through, and it was interesting because he was the first person to actually look at the distance and look at the heat flow along the ridge and the subsidence. Well, for the subsidence, he forgot the effect of the water, the loading effect of the water. So he didn't. He got was way out by almost a factor of third. Here, in terms of the heat flow, he forgot the effect of the water, so then that result of that was that, in fact, he was way out by a factor of two. Now, what is great about this, and, and, and being around Dan at that time, is, is you know, Dan, oh, let me go back. Yeah, Dan, let me go back. Okay, so the other question is that the two of us who looked at it, I mentioned Jean Prochteau, here's the thing of Jean Prochteau, and I will talk about it a little bit further. Okay. And he is one of our colleagues who most of us know about, who died about 10, no, eight years ago, um, who would have been here and did a lot of interesting work with the Quiet. So Dan actually saw clearly what you could do with this. He donned dimensionless size as a physicist. He got a plate model with an insight of seeing what you could do with something that's simple and physical. He developed it and he, he <clears throat> produced a, a bunch of diagrams, and especially the match to the heat flow, which of course the heat flow data was lousy, so the, the thickness of the plate he got was, was 50 kilometers. And that has always told me that the thing he regressed almost in worse than his own scientific career, that he, that he did not leave that paper simply as a set of non-dimensional, a non-dimensional model. <laughs> and, and he dimensionalized it. My, my retort to him, well, I said two retorts to Dan about this. First of all, he should have, he should have published his paper as a, as a reply to Le Pichon pointing it out the other way. And, and the second thing, that was wrong, I think, that what Dan did was absolutely a proper, a proper thing to do, and the insight was tremendous. <clears throat> but the, the other thing that he should have done, is, as I said there, is he should, he should not have dimensionalized what, was, what, what, he, what he had done. Okay, so then that was the place. Now, what happened then, was interesting is to a very set of numbers. Of course, we, in terms of the depth page, we've forgotten about the water. Um, I published a paper with Dan, which we did exactly the same thing, and we got the depths. And this was across the Galactic Spreading Center. Um, and then um, we went through a variety of models. Bill Menard tried to do depth and age and made a mistake. Um, I like what Doug said here about doing the gravity across it. Norm Sleep did another depth page paper, but he left out the, the fact that he had a fluid up here and a fluid down below, and he forgot this one here, so in fact he had, his model that he presented would had a grab, had a, basically would not be able to, to would have a big gravity anomaly over the ridge axis. And the person who was really important for us is Bob, 
because we were struggling through this thing and trying to get a model to, to put together. And in fact, Jean Faustil and Bob worked together, and he pointed out the problem of you have a fluid above and a fluid below, even if it's a larger density than the fluid down here. The problem you have to do is you have to take into account what's happening in the bottom. And this is actually the first physical model that was actually realistic. Now, what happened after that in terms of looking at depth and age, and that's where I'm going to go from here, is that Sean and I were able to, to see from looking at the, the, the data that we were doing in that model, that in fact, you, if you took a plate that was 100 kilometers thick and had a temperature over 1400 degrees, you could actually get a really good, clear fit okay, to the distance from the ridge axis and, and the substance in the North Pacific. And <coughs> with this in mind, okay, I've been looking for the possibility of going into the depth versus age. But when we started off to do this, we were still bugged a lot by the problem with the heat flow instruments. We still, at that point, did not know that there, that there was, could be a, heat, a match between the heat flow and, and the models in terms of age. And the depth we kind of knew was, gonna, was looking OK, but we still weren't totally convinced that, this, that, that the depth to age would work well. So what, what I did then is I started off. And um, I started on this paper with, uh, with uh, Roger Anderson and Lee Bell, and this also has a kind of interesting history, which is, <coughs> which is uh, like it, like uh, Barbara would say, well, people would say about it, but in fact, it, it had all the flavor taken out of it. Because in fact, what you see is the final product, not the way that we got there. And I thought it would be of interest to show you the problems with the way that we got, we got there. Yeah, the first diagram, of course, the sensible thing to do if you know where you're going, you know what you've done, and you know what the answer is, you should take a whole bunch of profiles like this across the across the eastern um, the eastern Pacific. This is actually came from Tanya's work that she did with with Bill Bernard, where you had the magnetic anomalies, you had the depth. You, you put all these things together, and you, you get this nice kind of set of data. You have all these. I don't know how many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's about twenty profiles here that you've done. Okay, you do the rest around the world, and what you end up with, at least around all the oceans. And what you end up with then, of course, is the thing that appears in a lot of the textbooks and, and not actually done. And Bob used it here in terms of the, the North Pacific and the, and the South Pacific, and you get this, this nice curve like that. And it, of course, the paper looks good, it, it actually reads quite well, and it makes, it makes me, when I read it back about 30 years later, that I think, gosh, far, I did something sensible. <laughs> well, that's not at all how it happened. <laughs> okay, the first thing, I wasn't going out to do anything to do with, with, with depth and age. I wanted to go look at the heat flow measurements on the method which you should see what change over here. Okay, here's the east Pacific rise, here's the ridge, okay? And you can look at all these profiles across the ridge. I didn't plan it that way, okay? Why it was the serendipity um, is that we got out and we did one crossing across the ridge axis aiming towards to get to the mathematician Seaman chain. And then what happened is that uh, we had a medical emergency on board the ship. So what happened is that we, they, they had to fly down some, some blood for somebody who was having some problems with his throat and the crew. And, and we actually had to go back into Africa when we came out. Now, one of the big advantages I had is I, I, I took um, a rather bright graduate student from, from Caltech with me who had never been to sea and wanted to go to sea with me. We, we, were, we actually did the central thing of plotting the depths as we went along, which I'd been taught by Dick Barkey and Morris Hill to do when you were at sea. So we're actually watching the topographic profiles. And when we did this, we had this really interesting set of profiles. I think one of the, yeah, one of the ones was this one here, which was very striking. We came across, and we show as we came up here, this, this kind of lip up here, then up to the central magnetic anomaly and down. And we looked at the rest of the profile, so we could see a problem there. And what it was clear that we were looking at at this point was as the, the ridge was spreading out, what was happening, it was jumping from one place to another. Okay, you were intruding another ridge in there. And that in fact, what you saw in the, in the, in the site was just this small amount of, um, 
of uh, change in, in depth due to the two-dimensional flow in the play mode. And uh, so I said, oh gosh, this is great, so I'm going to get into it. So the first thing I tried to do to do to get, get it moving and sort something out was to go back to the way that Xavier Le Pichon had done his stuff in the, in the 1965 paper, which was by uh, numerical methods, which is something that I use in my thesis. But <clears throat> at the time that I did this, which was 1969, on these small computers, I think it was a 1800 IBM machine, you couldn't get the width, you couldn't get the um, size of the of the, not, of the grid size small enough that you could actually look at the look at the depth. So I was always getting ringing in this thing, doing the whole thing, and it actually, and I just was totally frustrated. So one day, what I did is I came into the lab, and Lee Bell was actually he talk a little bit about it. He was there, and uh, he 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 looked at this and he, he thought about this. Well, he thought about it. He looked at the thoughts there and said, "Oh, I'm working on the five strands point. I think I could look at this thing and see if I can do it." Uh, I said, "No, boy. You know, here you are. You're just a lab. You know, you're third-year undergraduate at UCSD. You know, you're, you're not even doing physics." Okay. And yeah, I'll, you can do it, but I didn't expect anything to happen. Well, by <laughs> he came in on Monday and he done the whole thing, and he had talked a little bit about that as well. So. What happened, of course, is if you plot the, if you non dimensionalize this and plot x upon l, you can actually see a sort of predictive um, substance is going to look something like this, like that, and like that. And so if you look, if you, if you see this, you can get a really clear idea that what you're going to get is, uh, is an example of what's happening. It's kind of interesting. Here is to look at the composite topographic profiles from 21 degrees north to 60, 60 degrees north across um, these distances of rise. Here's the here's the current spreading center looking out, and you can see the jump and then the lip up here on either side, showing the intrusion of a, from a jumping spreading center that's come from the mathematician Seamounts. You're above the mathematician Seamounts, and it's actually a profile that goes all the way through. Again, on the other side of the mathematician see when it goes through like that. And this, so in fact, this is the area between here and here, where in fact we've had a very clear jump. jump. There's some indications of a jump that's at a different time from here and here, and then you go back south. And I'm not quite sure what happened with the profile here. I think Roger Anderson's going to talk a little bit about it, but I think the, the base depths that you're looking at in the ridges are, are also affected by gravity and not long. Convective systems below, which can actually up in a detailed thing, actually up with the the the, the, uh, the, the topography. So not, not all the profiles are exactly going to follow what you predict by depth age. The next thing that we actually did, and it's we would, what happened now, of course, is that Lee Bell and I submitted the paper to to uh, to, uh, to to JGR, and uh, that's where we had the, the first problem. Um, what happened is that I, we had, I was so sure I was right after seeing those profiles and looking at the thing and the, the two-dimensional stuff. Because it, to me, it kind of went to Tom, and Tom Hanks, who was there. Was, was that in fact, it, it had to be, it had to be, there was a smoking gun. I mean, if you threw it up and you see a sharp drop-off, then the thermal model had to be general. It had to be happening, and you would expect to see it all over the, all the ocean. So, we took two profiles in the Indian Ocean, two profiles in the Pacific, two profiles in the Atlantic, and I submitted it um, to JGR. Well, fortunately, JGR got reviewed by Ron Oxford and, um, and Fred Vine. And uh, we got very nice complimentary remarks. And then at the bottom, they said, well, we don't think this thing should be published. And then they said, what? Well, they said, no. Sorry, so to the author's detriment, Publish this paper, but it wasn't as crude as that. And then I, so I, of course, my, my heart was troubled. What the heck do we have to do? And then I read it carefully. I said, Look, these guys are right. Okay, there's a lot of profiles out there. They need to do the work and go do everything they can get their hands on. So at that point comes another funny thing in, this, in the story. Dan, okay, was traveling back. And I can't remember where in the states he was traveling from to, to San Diego. 
But sitting next to him was a was an under an undergraduate from Oklahoma. Okay? And the two of them got to talk. And one of the suggestions he said to, 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 to him was, why don't you, you know, when you go to Scripps and John, you know, and, and um, one of the people you should work with was, was John Slater. So that person was Roger Anderson, who had just come, come into, 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 into Vic Bakke's lab, the equal lab at that point. So he arrived fresh, and I needed, we needed somebody to do 80 profiles. <laughs> <laughs> So he got the second authorship on the paper. <laughs> so he sat down there and he he bust his ass because we knew that we got you know this is this is important. So we piled in there and did everything every profile we could we could get our hands on. And one of the I, I am so grateful to Lamont because Morris Ewing may have been a tough person in terms of, of keeping hold of the data, which he had a reputation. But the people who worked for him were incredible. I mean, Danny Hayes gave me, he didn't believe what I was doing. He said, John, as long as you publish this data and you make sure that you look at it carefully, I'm going to give you all the alternative data. And it was amazing. Dan and I, in terms of what, when we were actually doing the stuff that we did in the Indian Ocean, I, I went there and Ellen Heron gave us all of the Lamont magnetic digital data in the Indian Ocean. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, there's supposed to be some sort of animosity or something between Scripps and, and Lamont. I never saw it at all. I mean, I think there was real competition. But when it came down to the data, they were and they wanted to about ideas. They wanted they were really to, be, to be involved and to be to be helpful. So we did all these profiles, and so what we ended up with was, was is this really good curve and things that the people would use and. Uh, it was, you know, it, and it, it, it was pretty gratifying for that to actually happen. So, I can see that, what did we learn actually out of this? Okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to reach out for The only geophysicist did not read the work of oceanographers. <laughs> okay, that, Vega, and, and, and that's my summary of Holmes. But it's, it doesn't include, I mean, it includes Harry S. Um, it includes Bill Menard. I don't think the first three had ever ever understood that Murray did anything really sensible other than being a top class administrator and uh, doing you know, and that. Menard, Bill actually had read it, and there's a nice tribute to, to, to <clears throat> in his book, basically, to, to John Murray. But then, since 1965, and this is where I thought things should be coming, these errors were made, the community learned from them and progress was fast. I think, including me, I mean, everybody who, at that point, um, who was involved in the thermal problem made at least one mistake. The only person who didn't was Jason. And Jason wrote a wonderful paper on thermal models. Unfortunately, it never got published until 1972. And, and the thing I have in the back of my head, I, I, I asked Sami this because I knew he wasn't going to come here. I mean, how how did you how did you think about that model? Because I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it's it's mind blowing to think that somebody would think that having the simple intrusion, the ridge axis, we can move apart, and that that would actually explain everything that was going on. And he said, well, you know, it's, it was just the most obvious thing to do. It's kind of like George Backus's comments. George not here. But he made a wonderful comment when he was doing his first mini grid. He says, "Oh, what is it? The, it is obvious. No, everybody knows that the rotation of a, what is it, a rotation of a, of a cap on the top of a sphere moves about a point. It didn't even call a Euler sphere. But it's the same sort of throwaway thing that's obvious. It's just an obvious thing to do." What he, uh, what he didn't think about, and I presume basically being with you, uh, Ewing at that point, he wanted to, to come up with something that would not reuse plate tectonics. The interesting thing is, again, we saw in the deck versus age up to 80 million years was best fit for the boundary line model, but after that, by a plate model. And again, the point that I'd made at the beginning was coming back with, with Dagner and Holmes, and the fact that I think. <coughs> They got so much static for what they've done from the rest of the community that they stopped. Okay, and I, so I, I can't. I don't know if they didn't read the work by Murray, or whether if they had read it, 
they got so much criticism on the other side from other people who were against them that, that they actually stopped at that point. And of course, the last thing I have to do here is my apologies to Barbara. Okay. Fowler may have, I may have, you know, essentially, he's, he's got the name now for essentially some editors who take all the flavor out of research work. Okay? And he may or may not have a, a justified thing, but that's certainly what, what my thing I got from, from, from the comments that were made about it. But he had a really major effect upon, you know, early English 19th century society. Because what he did, is he had noticed from readings that were done to him by his father, to, and his family was all, were, were all very able with the people, that in fact his father, would, when they were young, would read Shakespeare and he would take certain bits of it out. And then he thought to himself, you know, that this is a very prudish society that he was dealing with, and a lot of people who should have been exposed to Shakespeare were not. So he in fact went in there and did, you know, and produced his extra, extra bit of versions. He also did it for Gibbon, and what it did is actually permitted adults to actually read Shakespeare and Gibbon to their children. And also when he died, the one great I was really impressed with, he, he led all of his inheritance, because he was a single person when he died, um, to the poor, and so the land of that point.